at us. Oh, let's start our uh, medallion lecture uh, by uh, Daniela Witten, and she has received his, her uh, PhD uh, degree uh, in uh, statistics at Stanford University in 2010. And she used to be an assistant professor at Department of Biostatistics, University of Washington, uh, 2010 to 2014 in an associate professor, Department of Statistics and Biostatistics uh, in the uh, University of Washington, 2014 to 2018. And now she is a professor of the uh, uh, Department of Statistics and Biostatistics of uh, University of Washington from uh, 2018 to present. And uh, she is an elected member of International Statistical Institute uh, in 2019, and a fellow uh, of American Statistical uh, Association in 2020. And she has written many, many interesting and important papers and a uh, co-author of the textbook, uh, Introduction to Statistical Learning, which I have used uh, in my uh, grade course last semester. And, uh, her uh, main uh, research area includes uh, high dimensional data in statistical learning, genomics, uh, neuroscience, and classification, among others. Okay, um, each year IMS uh, nominates eight uh, medallion lectures and fills across the IMS subject range. The award of a medallion signals the honor inherent in being selected to give one of these. Uh, lectures. IMS awards the medallion to Professor Daniela uh, Witten and invites you to present a medallion lecture entitled Selective Inference for Trees. Now you can start. Thank you so much for the very kind um, introduction and it's really just such a privilege for me to have the opportunity to give a medallion lecture today. So um, thanks so much to the IMS for that honor. So today I'm gonna to talk about some of my work on beyond sample splitting, a selective inference on trees. And this is for me a really fun thing to talk about because it, um, it has to do with kind of like a real problem that people are actually facing out in the field when they analyze their data. And so we all know how data analysis should work. Um, it's the way that we write our textbooks and the way that we teach our courses. So we know that in theory, what we should do is that before we ever look at our data, perhaps before we even collect our data, we should know exactly what hypotheses we plan to test. And then we should only ever test those hypotheses. So this is how we write our textbooks. This is how we teach our students. But unfortunately, um, as is often the case in life, there's a gap between the theory and the practice. Because in practice, the way that we do data analysis looks more like this. Uh, we typically visualize our data, we cluster it, we perform event introduction and more. And only after doing that exploratory data analysis do we decide what hypotheses to test. And so there's a bit of a gap between what we teach and what we do. Um, and in particular, we tell everybody to do exploratory data analysis, but then we, we tell them that they're not supposed to perform hypothesis testing based on the output of that exploratory data analysis. So there really is a bit of a discrepancy. So this discrepancy between the theory and the practice comes up a lot in, in many different analyses. It really comes up anytime that we do exploratory data analysis. But in particular, in this talk today, I'm gonna to focus on what happens if we wish to perform, a, if we wish to test a hypothesis, um, which is based on the output of developing a tree, either a, uh, a clustering dendrogram resulting from hierarchical clustering or a decision tree resulting from the classification and regression trees algorithm. So in particular, we can focus on the example of clustering to understand really what happens um, if we develop a hypothesis based on clustering and then we test it based on the same data. So uh, here is a simulated data set with 100 observations just from a normal zero one noise model with two features. So there's no signal here in the data. There's, there's no true clusters. Um, but we can perform hierarchical clustering to get a dendrogram or a tree. And we cut this dendrogram to obtain three clusters, which look like this. And of course, these clusters are not real. 
in the sense that this is just noise data that we clustered. But what we can anticipate is that if we perform clustering, excuse me, if we, if we perform a hypothesis test to test for a difference in means between, let's say, the orange and the green clusters, we may erroneously reject the null hypothesis, even though we happen to know because we simulated the data that the null hypothesis holds. So I'm gonna to refer to this problem sort of offhand as double dipping. And the reason it's double dipping is because we've sort of dipped into our data twice, once to cluster the data, and then once to test a hypothesis about it, about those clusters. So as statisticians, we can look at this, this pipeline where you have clustered the data and then you test a hypothesis about your clusters and we can sort of see what's wrong with that. Uh, the thing that's wrong with it is that, is that we've double dipped. We've defined our hypothesis as a function of the data. But the key point is that even if we don't like this pipeline, and even if we as statisticians think that it's problematic, this is 100% something that data analysts are doing out in the field in a lot of areas. But in particular, today I'll give an example from the analysis of single cell RNA sequencing data, which is a very popular data type in genomics that's really grown to be perhaps the most important data type in genomics in the last several years. Um, and a very common analysis pipeline that they perform in that field is to cluster cells on the basis of gene expression data, and then to test for a difference in means between those clusters of cells. So whether or not you like it, this is absolutely what people are trying to do. And so the question is, what is wrong with this pipeline and how can we fix it using ideas from the selective inference uh, literature? Okay, so in a little more detail, this is simulated data. I've sampled 100 observations. I'm going to cluster the observations to get three clusters. And now I just want to test the null hypothesis that the mean of, let's say, the green cluster equals the mean of the orange cluster. And if I just suspend this belief for a moment and I don't think too hard about what I'm doing, I might be tempted to perform, let's say, like a multivariate z-test, a walled type test which basically just calculates the difference between the, the distances between the cluster means and then divides by a suitable denominator. And if I do this, I find that all three p-values are very, very small. So there's three p-values because there's three pairs of clusters. Um, so all of those p-values are less than 10 to the negative six, even though there's no true clusters in the data. So any clusters that I estimate are just noise. So something has gone wrong. And the question is, how do we fix this? Um, so we can try to fix this using a very simple approach, which is sample splitting. And so when I think about the double dipping problem in general, sample splitting is sort of the first and bluntest tool that I have available to me. Um, but interestingly, in this particular setting, sample splitting is not going to get us out of jail free. In fact, it won't really help us at all. So to see that, we can think about how sample splitting works. So on the left, I have a null data set with, with no signal and I can split it into a training set and a test set. And then I'm gonna cluster the training set. Here I've, I've found two clusters in the training set using my favorite clustering method. The details are not important of how we cluster it. And then I can apply those clusters obtained on the training set to the test set. And again, the details of exactly how I apply those training set clusters to the test set turn out, turns out really not to be important, but just for the sake of making the slide, I use three nearest neighbors classification. So in order to color a uh, test set observation orange or green, I found its three nearest neighbors on the training data. And if the majority of those three nearest neighbors were orange, then I color the test observation orange. And if the majority were green, then I colored it green. And now we can say, okay, well, given the test data now, can I test for a difference in means between the orange and the green observations? Um, but if it, it turns out that if I do this, sort of not surprisingly, if you look at the diagram, I once again get a p-value that's way too small. And the reason that it's too small is that, is that this is null data, so I know that there are no true clusters. So, huh, well, what, what went wrong here? Somehow sample splitting didn't get me out of jail free, even though I got my clusters on the training data and I was just evaluating them on the test data. And basically the issue is that the operation by which I labeled the test observations using the training set clusters inherently involved double dipping because in determining the three nearest neighbors for each test observation, I had to use information about the features for those test observations, which caused me to double dip my data. 
And it turns out that it, it, the, the details of how I clustered the training data or how I transferred those cluster labels from the training data to the test set really don't matter. You can imagine that you just have like a very long ruler and you just drop your ruler onto the, the test data. And then depending on where the ruler falls, depending on which side of the ruler an observation falls on, you either color it orange or green. So that's completely not a data-driven operation at all. And yet, if you do that, if you color the observations on one side of the ruler orange and on the other side green, and then you conduct a, a two-sample wall test comparing the means of those two sets of observations, you'll, you'll get um, p-values that are much smaller than uniform. So inherently, sample splitting cannot be used to solve this problem. Um, and so we're going to need to be a little bit more clever than, than would be possible using sample splitting. Because again, sample splitting has an inflated selective type 1 error rate here. So in case you think I'm just showing you sort of pathological simulated examples that I chose very carefully, well, I didn't. Uh, here's the QQ plot where we see the uniform, or rather the quantiles of the uniform 0, 1 distribution against the quantiles of this naive p-value that I've been describing that doesn't account for the fact that clusters are estimated from the data. Um, and we'd hope that under the null hypothesis, the p-value should be uniformly distributed, which would mean that they'd be hugging the 45 degree line. But of course they're not, um, the p-values are not uniform. And in fact, if we try to uh, reject the null hypothesis anytime the p-value is less than 0.05, then we achieve a selective type one error rate of 97% in this particular example. And I'll, I'll talk more about what I mean by selective type one error in a couple of minutes. Okay, so that's sort of the overview and the motivation for my talk. Um, but this talk today is going to have two parts. I'm first going to talk about this double dipping problem in clustering and how we can fix it using the framework of selective inference. And then in the second part of my talk, I'm going to very briefly talk about double dipping and regression trees obtained using the CART algorithm. Okay, so now we've, we've seen the setup. We have some observations, we cluster them, and then we want to test for a difference in means between those clusters. So again, the, the question we're asking is, are the cluster means really different? Is there really a difference between the population mean of the orange observations and the population mean of the green observations, for example? So we can phrase this a little bit more statistically. So we can think about X as an N by Q data set with N observations on the rows and Q features on the columns. And the i row is drawn from a normal distribution um, with some Q-dimensional mean vector mu i and then some covariance. And here, just to keep the notation simple, I've written the covariance as sigma squared times the identity. Um, but I'll, everything I'll be talking about today applies for a non-identity and a non-diagonal covariance matrix. Um, but we do need the covariance to be known. So just to emphasize, the covariance matrix does not need to be diagonal, but it, it does need to be known. If, if you're estimating the covariance, then things are a bit more complicated. So the idea is we're going to cluster this data set. We'll cluster the rows of the data set to get estimated clusters C1 hat through CK hat, where K is the number of estimated clusters. And so each of these clusters, it contains the indices for the observations in that cluster. So like the C hat one contains the indices of the observations that are in the first estimated cluster and so on. And then I'm going to define mu bar CK hat to be the mean associated with the kth cluster. So if you look at mu bar CK hat, it's a little bit of a weird quantity. And the reason that it's weird is because it sort of looks like a population quantity because it involves the mu i's, which are population parameters. But it also involves CK hat, which is a function of the data because that's the kth estimated cluster. So mu bar CK hat is this weird thing that's not really a sample quantity, but it's also not a population quantity. And that's, that's really going to be sort of the fundamental issue here. Because what we want to do is test the null hypothesis that mu bar CK hat equals mu bar CK prime for some pair of clusters, um, which are the kth and k prime clusters. But the issue is that um, there's something that doesn't pass the sniff test about this null hypothesis because the, the so-called parameters are actually functions of the data. So in order to be able to test this null hypothesis in a meaningful way, we're not going to be able to just plow through and just ignore the fact that this null hypothesis is weird like, like we tried to before because that won't result in control of the selective type 1 error. Instead, we're going to have to be careful, and in particular, we're going to use the, the, the tool set from selective inference in order to address this problem.
But if we just suspend disbelief for a second and just ignore the fact that there's something wrong with this null hypothesis, then we can just write out a p-value that's basically just a wall test. It's the probability under the null hypothesis of no difference in cluster means of observing at least as large of a difference in the cluster means as what we observed, where here x bar ck hat is the mean of the observations in the case cluster. And the denominator here is just chosen um, to make everything work out nicely. And then using the fact that xi is drawn from a normal distribution, uh, we can see that this is just the probability that a chi-squared random variable with q degrees of freedom exceeds some threshold. But as we saw, this is not uniformly distributed under the null. So this is what I'll be calling the naive test, and it's the thing that we've already seen um, doesn't behave well under the null. And the reason that it's not uniformly distributed under the null is because it's nowhere accounting for the fact that this the k and k prime clusters were estimated from the data. So we would expect x bar c hat k minus x bar c hat k prime to actually be pretty big because otherwise we probably wouldn't have estimated those clusters. So to fix this problem, what we need to do is to condition on the hypothesis selection procedure. And in particular, what I mean by that is we're going to condition on the thing that caused us to be interested in this null hypothesis. We never would have even thought about this null hypothesis if clustering the data hadn't given us c hat k and c hat k prime. So what we're going to do is we're going to define a p-value, which is the probability under the null hypothesis of seeing at least as big of a difference in the cluster means as what we saw, given the clustering the data gave us these two particular clusters. So just to say it again, we're asking, out of all data sets that result in these two particular clusters, what's the probability, assuming that there is no true difference in the cluster means, of seeing such a large difference between the sample means of the case and k prime clusters. And so this new p-value controls the selective type one error, which is the error given that the null hypothesis is true, but also given that we've decided to test this null hypothesis. And so the thing that makes this a selective type one error rather than just a regular type one error is that we're, we're considering the error rate given that we decided to test that null hypothesis. In other words, given that we actually estimated those two clusters. Because if we had an estimated of those clusters, then we wouldn't have tested the null hypothesis. So conceptually, this p-value makes a lot of sense, and it, it gives us what we want, which is selective type 1 error control. But unfortunately, in practice, this p-value is very hard to compute. Just because we can write it down doesn't mean that we know how to calculate it. And in particular, this conditioning set, the set of x that give us the clusters CIK k and CIK k prime, um, even under the null hypothesis, it's really hard to characterize that set x, the set of x, because it involves a lot of nuisance parameters that aren't specified under the null. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to condition on a bit more. We're going to come up with some additional things to condition on, which are going to be carefully chosen so that when we condition on those additional things, we will actually be able to compute this p-value. And the very important thing to realize is the conditioning on this additional information will still maintain the selective type 1 error control. So we won't lose selective type 1 error control by conditioning on more things. We do potentially lose a bit of power, so we want to avoid conditioning on more than we need to. Um, but what we'll see in a minute is that we have a very natural set of additional things that we can condition on that will um, allow us to compute this p-value analytically for many types of clustering of interest and that will not cost us too much in terms of power. Okay, so what else are we going to condition on? So we're going to define the p-value once again to be the probability under the null hypothesis of seeing such a big difference in means between the clusters, given that clustering the data gives us the k and CIK prime, but also conditional on a little bit of more, where this additional bit that we're going to condition on involves some linear algebra so we're going to condition on the direction of the difference in means between the two clusters of interest. And we're also going to condition on the orthogonal projection onto the space that's orthogonal to the vector nu hat, where nu hat is the vector such that x transpose nu hat gives us the difference in means between the estimated clusters. So this, this may seem like a bizarre set of things to condition on, but bear with me. We'll see in a minute that this has a very natural geometric interpretation. 
So before we get to that geometric interpretation, we have a result that just falls out of, um, you know, as a stat 101 course, which is that this p-value can just be written as the probability under the null hypothesis the random, that a random variable phi exceeds some threshold, given that clustering x prime of phi gives us phi at k and phi at k prime, where x prime of phi is an n by q data set, um, where the i row is equal to x i plus a constant if the ith observation is in the kth estimated cluster. It's equal to x i minus a constant if the ith observation is in the k prime estimated cluster. And it's just equal to the original data x i if the ith observation is not in either of the clusters of interest. So it turns out that we can visualize this uh, very easily. So what does this, this data set x prime of phi look like? Well, suppose this is our original data where the, the cluster C hat K is shown in blue and the cluster C hat K prime is shown in orange. And those are the two clusters of interest because we're testing the null hypothesis that um, mu bar C hat K equals mu bar C hat K prime. And there may be some other observations that are not in either the K or the K prime clusters and those ones are shown in purple. So this is the original data. And so what does X prime of C look like? And I should mention the dashed line is just the line passing through the, the sam sample mean of the K cluster minus the sample mean of the K prime cluster. So what does X prime of C look like? Well, X prime of C is shown on the right for a large value of C. And it turns out that X prime of C is just a perturbation of the original data X, where if C is large, then what X prime of phi does is it just pulls the blue and the orange clusters apart from each other while keeping the purple cluster or the, the remaining observations fixed. So the, the purple observations haven't moved. All that's moved are the two clusters of interest and they've gotten pulled away from each other when phi is large. By contrast, when phi is small, then X prime of phi just takes the original data and keeps everything the same except for the blue and orange clusters and it just smooshes those together. And when phi equals the difference in means between those two estimated clusters, or rather, yeah, when phi equals the difference in observed, the observed difference in means between those estimated clusters, then x prime of phi just keeps the data exactly as is. So x prime of phi no longer perturbs the data. So to summarize, x prime of phi is just this perturbation of the original data x that either pulls apart if phi is large or smooshes together if phi is small the two clusters of interest, which are CIK and CIK prime, while leaving any observation that's not in one of those two clusters fixed. Okay, so just to summarize, we've, we've defined this perturbation of the data that I'm calling X prime of phi. And so the p-value that I'm interested in, it turns out can be written as just the probability under the null hypothesis that a random variable phi exceeds some threshold given that clustering X prime of phi gives me the clusters C at K and C at K prime. So remember, phi parameterizes how much the two clusters of interest have been pulled apart or smooshed together. And if we pull these two clusters of interest apart, then we're probably going to keep on getting the clusters C at K and C at K prime. If we smoosh them together, then eventually we're no longer going to get C at K and C at K prime as our clusters. So the p-value interest is the probability that phi exceeds some threshold, given that phi will still give us the cluster C at K and C at K prime when we cluster the data X prime of phi. So what we're saying here is out of all data sets of the form X prime of phi that give us C at K and C at K prime, what's the probability, assuming there's no true difference in means, of observing such a large difference in the sample means of the K and K prime clusters? Oops, all right, sorry, I think I clicked the wrong way. So to calculate this p-value, it turns out the job seems pretty easy because our p-value is just the probability that this random variable phi exceeds some threshold given that clustering x prime of phi gives us the two clusters of interest. So to calculate that, we just need to take the CDF of a chi distribution with q degrees of freedom and truncate that CDF to the set S, where S is the set of phi, such the clustering X prime of phi gives us C at K and C at K prime. So this is almost something we can just do in one line of R code, 
because it just involves the CDF of a, of a chi distribution. But there's one problem, which is that I need to know the set S. So if I had like an analytical expression for the set S, or if I could tell you that the set S, you know, was like the interval from 2.17 to infinity or something, then we'd be done. But of course, I don't know the set S. And it turns out that computing the set S is, is first of all, critically important to be able to calculate this p-value in practice. But second of all, it's a really challenging problem. So everything that I've talked about so far, it wasn't specific to any type of clustering. You could perform hierarchical clustering or k-means clustering or spectral clustering or, or any type of clustering that you like. And everything that I've said so far would hold. But starting right now, the results that I'm gonna be showing are going to be specific to hierarchical clustering. And the reason for this is that I'm gonna be talking about how we can analytically characterize the set S. And to do that, we need to be able to think about really how the particular clustering that we're thinking about operates and how it would operate on a perturbation of the data X prime of phi. And so that's gonna to have to be specialized to a particular type of clustering. So our ability to analytically characterize the set S relies on a really key result, which is shown at the top of the slide. And that key result is that the, so remember C hat K and C hat K prime are two clusters that we got using the original data X. And so the result is the clustering X prime of phi will give us C hat K and C hat K prime as well. If and only if the trees or the dendrograms from those, that clustering are identical up to the N minus K merge. So in other words, the only way that you can get C hat K and C hat K prime from the perturbed data X prime of phi is if the dendrogram that came out of X and the dendrogram that came out of X, came, X prime of phi are literally identical beneath the spot where those clusters came from. So here's what I mean. Uh, suppose that this is our data and I, I cut the dendrogram to give me two clusters. Uh, one cluster contains the third and fifth observation and the other cluster contains the second, first and fourth observation. And then suppose that I also cluster the perturbed data X prime of phi. And again, I get two clusters, one containing the first, second and fourth observations and the other containing the third and fifth observations. So notice that the clusters on the left and the clusters on the right are identical because the two clusters in both cases contain one, two, four, and then also three, five. Okay, well, what I'm telling you, what the top of the slide indicates is that this is impossible. What I've shown you here literally can't happen. And the reason that it can't happen is because of what's on the top of the slide, where I'm telling you the clustering X prime of V can give you CIK and CIK prime, if and only if the trees are identical up to the N minus K merge. So the only way that these clusters could be the same is if below the dashed line, everything has to be identical. But what we see is that below the dashed line, these two trees are not identical. So in particular, notice that like on the left-hand side, the first merge is between the first and fourth observations. But on the right-hand side, the first merge is between the second and fourth observations. So we can completely rule out the possibility that X prime of V would ever give us a tree that looks like the one on the right. And that allows us to characterize the set of phi such that clustering X prime of phi results in CIK and CIK prime as the intersection over all of the merges in the dendrogram happening below the dashed line of the set of phi such that the same pair of clusters merge at the alt step in both dendrograms. So this allows us to begin to get a handle on the set S. And furthermore, we can rewrite this as the intersection over all pairs of clusters that don't merge in the first n minus k steps in x. That's the intersection over the order of n squared sets. Where it's the intersection over the set of phi such that the dissimilarity between a and b and x prime of phi exceeds the maximum height at which clusters merge at any time that a and b are present in the dendrogram based on x. So this is just a really long way of saying that, that because the, the only way that X prime of phi can give us the cluster CIK and CIK prime is if everything below the time when those clusters appears is identical in both X prime of phi and X, that means that we can characterize the set S as just the intersection over order of N squared inequalities. And what's really important, or rather the, in, the intersection over order of N squared sets. And what's really important about each of these order of n squared sets is that it can be characterized actually as a quadratic inequality in phi for some very common types of linkage. 
in particular for average linkage, centroid linkage, median linkage, and word linkage, which are four of the most popular types of hierarchical clustering. Um, and of course, a quadratic inequality, um, evaluating a set that's defined by a quadratic inequality just requires the quadratic equation, which of course we know how to do very efficiently. So what that means is that we can actually characterize the set F analytically in order of n squared time for average linkage, centroid linkage, median, and word linkage. And that's pretty amazing because what it means is that um, we can ca characterize the set S and therefore compute this selective inference p-value in the same order of time that it takes to perform the hierarchical clustering in the first place. So performing hierarchical clustering, like the fastest algorithms are like order of n squared. And so that means that you essentially in the same computation time can perform inference as well. So another popular type of linkage that I haven't mentioned so far is single linkage. And it turns out that you can also calculate the set S for single linkage in order of n squared time using a different argument than the one shown on this slide, but it's actually a simpler argument um, than the one shown here. Okay, so just to summarize uh, where we are, what we wanted to do was test the null hypothesis that the mean in the k cluster equals the mean in the k prime cluster where the clusters are estimated from the data. And we came up with a, a p-value that controls the selective type one error, which is just a simple function of the CDF of a chi-square distribution with q degrees of freedom truncated to a particular set S. Uh, the hard part involved characterizing the set S analytically. And we show that we can compute the set S in order of n squared time for average centroid median ward and single linkage. Um, now you might be wondering if there's any big um, hierarchical clustering fans in the house. You might be wondering about the fact that I haven't mentioned complete linkage, which is sort of the, the remaining popular type of linkage that wasn't listed here. And it turns out that we do not know how to compute the set S efficiently for complete linkage. However, we can efficiently approximate the p-value for complete linkage using Monte Carlo. And furthermore, if you're interested in some other kind of clustering that isn't hierarchical clustering, like k-means clustering or spectral clustering, then uh, we have a Monte Carlo approach that will allow you to efficiently approximate this p-value. Okay. So how does it work? Um, well, the first thing we should do is just verify that we have selective type one error control because it would be a pity if we made it this far and then we weren't controlling the selective type one error. <laughs> so uh, here's the same simulation setup that I showed you before where we just have observations that are just uh, normally distributed with some mean and some covariance with mean zero and some covariance. So here the null hypothesis holds no matter which clusters we estimate. So we're gonna obtain three clusters with hierarchical clustering and we're going to test the null hypothesis for a randomly chosen pair of clusters. And no matter which clusters we estimate, we know that the null hypothesis holds because of how we simulated the data. And again, we'll compute the p-value analytically for average centroid and single linkage, and we'll approximate the p-value using Monte Carlo for complete linkage. All right, so here's what we get. Um, for average centroid, single, and complete linkage, these are QQ plots. Um, so the, the different colors represent slightly different simulation setups in terms of the number of features and the amount of variance in the noise model. Um, and we would like each of these curves to hug the 45 degree line because that indicates um, selective type one error control. And indeed, we see that, that everything looks really nice. The p-values look uniformly distributed. So we do have selective type one error control. So of course, selective type one error control um, is not enough by itself. We also need to have power. So to think about power, I'm gonna start by just showing a fun example, which is uh, known as the Palmer Penguins data, step, data set, excuse me, the Palmer Penguins data set, which consists of measurements of species, bill length and flipper length for 165 penguins. So the penguins belong to three species, uh, Chinstrap, Gen 2, and Adeli. And for each of the penguins, we know their bill length and their flipper length. So the first thing that we do is we apply hierarchical clustering to the penguins data to get six clusters. And here I happen to know the species of the clusters. And in fact, the species are displayed using circles, triangles, and squares. But that information was not passed into the clustering algorithm. This is unsupervised clustering that does not use the species labels. Um, so the colors here represent the clusters that we've estimated. And so the first thing that I'm gonna do is test for a difference in means 
between the green and the orange clusters. And I happen to know that these are all, um, or almost all, Adelie penguins. So I suspect that there should not really be a difference in means between these clusters. And indeed, when I compute a naive p-value that doesn't account for the fact that the clusters are estimated from the data, I get a very small p-value, less than 0.01, indicating that I would probably want to reject the null hypothesis. Whereas our selective p-value that does account for the fact that the clusters are estimated from the data is a very modest 0.87. So this sort of lends credence to the idea that um, our selective p-value is controlling the, the selective type 1 error in that it doesn't find a statistically significant difference between these two clusters above and beyond what you'd expect based on the fact that the clusters are estimated from the data. Now we can think about testing for a difference in means between this, the green and the pink clusters. And I happen to know that the pink ones are all Gen 2 penguins and the green ones are almost exclusively Adelie penguins with just a few chin straps. So I suspect that, that these sets of penguins probably do differ with respect to flipper and bill length. And indeed, uh, what I find is both the naive p-value and the selective p-value are tiny on the order of 10 to the negative 15. So I will certainly reject the null hypothesis that the, the two cluster means are equal. And this is really nice because what this means is that in this particular example, when I don't believe the null hypothesis holds, in fact, I am able to reject it even with my selective p-value. And in fact, I really don't take any kind of visible hit in terms of power when the null hypothesis does not hold. So now I just want to go on to another example, which involves single cell RNA sequencing data. So I'm sure many of you have seen single cell data before, but for those who haven't, single cell RNA sequencing data is sort of the evolution of the technology from back when people used to use microarrays to collect gene expression data. Um, it sort of has two main differences. One is that the data, for, this is gene expression data, but the data for every gene is quantified in a much more precise way than used to be possible using a microarray. And second of all, microarrays used to just essentially put a tissue sample in a blender and just provide average expression for that tissue sample. But with single cell data, each individual cell, is its gene expression is measured individually. So, the observations here are actually individual cells from a tissue sample. So this is just a much richer data set that is uh, much larger in terms of the number of observations because now the observations are individual cells rather than tissue samples. So we're gonna look at um, this data set from, from a Nature Communications paper published a few years ago. And this data set consists of T cells, B cells, and monocytes, um, which are three different types of immune cells. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to actually subsample these cells. So first we're going to take 600 T cells and we're going to call that the, the quote unquote no clusters data set. And I'm calling it the no clusters data set because these are all T cells. So I don't really believe that there's any clusters among the T cells. And then I'm also going to take 200 B cells, 200 T cells and 200 monocytes. And I'm going to call that the clusters data set because I do believe that there's clusters. In my heart, I believe the B cells, the T cells, and the monocytes probably differ with respect to gene expression. And then I'm going to spare you the details of, of how I pre-process the data, except to say that I did a very standard pre-processing routine. And then I applied the hypothesis test that I've talked about today. Um, but it wouldn't be reasonable to assume that genes are um, uncorrelated with each other. So instead, I've modified the test that I talked about today to allow for a, um, a non-diagonal covariance matrix. Okay, so here's um, what the data looks like if I project it onto the first two principal components. Um, and then I cluster the data to obtain three clusters. Uh, single cell RNA sequencing data has tens of thousands of features. So this is this representation onto the first two principal components only explains around 5% of the variation in the data, um, which is why the three clusters that I estimated shown in green, red, and blue don't appear to be very spread out. That's because we're only seeing 5% of the variation in the data right now. Um, and remember, these are all T cells. So here I've clustered a single cell type. So I believe that there aren't really, these estimated clusters are just noise. I don't think that I've really found any signal here. And indeed, while the naive p-values are very small, uh, they're smaller than 0.001, my selective p-values between each pair of estimated clusters are much more modest. They're around 0.7. So once again, this sort of passes the sniff test that if I don't believe that there's any clusters there, then I'm not able to reject the null hypothesis. 
And by contrast, here's what I get on the data where I've taken intentionally 200 B cells, 200 memory cells, and 200 monocytes. Now the naive p-values are on the order of 0.001. And what's really very cool is that our selective p-values are almost identical to the naive p-values um, around 0.001. So what we see is that, um, once again, if there are true clusters in the data set, then we really don't take much of a hit in terms of power by controlling the selective type one error. Um, and so it's almost like, I mean, it's, there's, it's not a free lunch because there's no free lunch, of course, but it, it's pretty close to a free lunch in terms of the fact that we're able to control the selective type one error while still getting reasonable power under the alternative. Okay, so just very briefly in the time that I have left, um, I'm gonna just present um, the second part of my talk, which really applies the same set of ideas within the context of decision trees. And in particular, I'm gonna talk about decision trees that we fit um, using the classification and regression tree or CART algorithm of Fryman and others. So what's the idea here? Um, well, I'm gonna sample 100 observations from a noise model. And what's really critical here is to understand is that whereas before I was talking about an unsupervised problem, where I just had features but no response. Uh, now, this is a supervised problem. So associated with each of these 100 observations, there's a response to that Y, which is represented with the color of these points. So the lighter colors of the points indicates a large value of Y, and the darker points have a smaller value of Y. But here, there's just noise. So, so the Y values are just drawn from a normal mean zero distribution. So in step two, I'm gonna fit a decision tree using the CART algorithm. And here I've just fit a very small decision tree. It just has two terminal nodes. And if you um, aren't familiar with the CART algorithm, basically what it does is it recursively builds a decision tree by looking for the either horizontal or vertical split in the data that leads to the largest difference in the means on either side of the split. So right here, that red line is exactly positioned in the place where the mean to the left of the split is as different as possible from the mean to the right of the split. So then I can ask the question, is there really a difference between these two means? So gosh, you know, by I, negative 0.92 looks quite a bit smaller than positive 0.12. But I do need to remember that I could have put that red line anywhere vertically or anywhere horizontally in order to make that difference look as big as possible. So in asking the question of whether there's really a difference between the means, I again need to account for the fact that I've double dipped. In other words, I've, I've actually fit the tree to make that difference look as big as possible. And once again, that brings us into a selective inference framework. Um, but if we, if we try to naively answer this question without accounting for the fact that we've double dipped, then we'll get a very small p-value in this particular example, 0 0.002, which would cause us to falsely reject the null hypothesis of no difference in means. Okay, so we can phrase it a little more statistically. So first of all, on the left, um, I'm showing you an example of a decision tree. And I'm going to be referring to the regions RA and RB as sibling nodes. And they're siblings in the sense that they are two terminal nodes that came out of the same parent node. So I have a data set XY, where X is a P vector of covariates, which is fixed. Y is random with mean mu sub I. And sigma squared is some known variance. I'm going to fit a cart tree to predict Y using X. And then for any region R coming out of the CAR tree, I'm going to define y, sub, y bar sub R to be the mean of the observations in the Rth region, and mu bar sub R to be the mean of the mu i's in the Rth region. And I'm going to test the null hypothesis that mu bar sub R A equals mu bar sub R B, where R sub A and R sub B are two sibling nodes in the CAR tree. So what's critically important is that, once again, mu bar sub so RA and mu bars of RB are not quite population parameters because R sub A and R sub B were estimated based on the data. So we can just try to brute force it, um, suspend disbelief, and try to come up with a naive test, which in this case is essentially a walled test, a two, a two sample Z test rather, for a difference in means. Um, but if we do this, we're not gonna control the selective type one error, which by now should not come as a surprise. And again, the problem is that here we haven't accounted for the fact that the regions R sub A and R sub B were estimated from the data. So what we need to do is condition on the fact that RA and RB are siblings in a tree. Because if, if they were not sibling terminal nodes in a tree, then we never would have tested the null hypothesis. 
So we're going to test the null hypothesis that, or excuse me, we're going to compute a p-value, which is the probability under the null hypothesis of no difference in means between the terminal nodes of observing such a diff big difference in means, given that R and R B happen to be siblings in the tree. So in order to ease computation, just as we saw in the clustering case, we're going to need to condition on a bit more information, um, which will still allow us to control the selective type 1 error. So in particular, we're going to condition not only on the fact that RA and RB are siblings in the tree, but also on the projection of the data onto the space orthogonal to a vector nu, where nu transpose y um, gives us the that's a typo, I apologize, nu transpose y equals y bar r sub a minus y bar r sub b. And it turns out that this is just the probability under the null hypothesis that phi exceeds some threshold, given that RA and RB are siblings in tree Y prime of phi, where Y prime of phi is a perturbation of the data, um, where the i throw of Y prime of phi is equal to the i throw of Y plus the constant, if I is in terminal node R sub A, it's equal to Y i minus the constant, if I is in the R sub B terminal node, and otherwise, the i throw of y prime of phi is the same as the i throw of y if the i observation isn't in either of the two terminal nodes of interest. So what we're saying here is out of all data realizations of the form y equals y prime of phi, such that r a and r b are siblings in the tree of y prime of phi, what's the probability under the null hypothesis of observing such a large difference in the sample means? All right, so we're almost done. But what we have to do is, is efficiently compute the set of phi such that RA and RB are siblings in tree Y prime of phi. And we're going to have to do this using properties of the CART algorithm. We're going to need to really dig in, understand how CART works in order to be able to efficiently characterize the set phi. And so we can do that using a key result that's shown on the top of the slide. And what the result says is that RA, if RA and RB are siblings in tree Y prime of phi, then actually tree Y prime of phi is identical to tree of Y. So suppose that um, the tree on the original data Y is shown on the left, and then the tree on Y prime of phi is shown on the right. I notice that both of these trees contain RA and RB, but the trees are not identical because if you compare the first split on the left to the first split on the right, they're not quite the same. So what this result is telling you is that the scenario on the right can't happen because the only way that R and R B can be siblings in tree of Y prime of phi is if the trees themselves are identical. So the situation on the right can happen, and that actually, it turns out, allows us to efficiently characterize the set of phi such that R and R B are siblings in tree Y prime of phi as the intersection of a whole bunch of quadratic sets in phi. Okay, so in other words, characterizing the set of phi such that R and R B are siblings in tree Y prime of phi simplifies substantially. Okay, so I just want to conclude with just a very brief example to a data set called the Box Lunch Study. This is a randomized trial of the effect of portion size intervention on the number of calories consumed by participants. And in, in one of the key papers describing the study, the authors used the CART algorithm to identify subgroups of patients with different baseline caloric intake based on a questionnaire and a lab-based assessment. So essentially, they fit a cart tree, and then the conclusions that they drew were based on this cart tree. And so what we can do is we can reconsider that analysis, this time using the p-values that we can compute for each split in the tree. And so the, our value add are these selective inference p-values, which I've shown in pink circles. So for example, if we look at this tree, the first split that the investigators found was a split based on the hunger variable. So if, if you'd expect if you're hungrier, if your baseline hunger is higher, you're probably going to have a higher caloric intake. Um, and that was sort of the linchpin for some of their conclusions in their study. But our p-value that we computed for that split is actually quite modest. It's 0.44. So in other words, when we, when we analyze this data, we don't really find that there's actually a difference in means based on whether or not someone's hunger at random variable is, is or the, rather their hunger feature is larger than 1.8. And similarly, the next split in the tree is involves the wanting variable and whether or not that's less than 0.57, that has to do with how much you want food. Um, but once again, the p-value that we found is a very modest 0.2. Uh, and in fact, none of our p-values meet any sort of um, significant threshold, which really calls into question the 
maybe the importance of the split sound on, on this analysis of this box lunch study. Okay, um, so that's basically all that I want to say. Um, for more details, we've got papers on archive um, that we're really excited to share with you. Um, we also have some software that we've really invested a lot of effort into. Um, these are our packages available on GitHub um, with really nice, I hope you find them nice tutorials um, helping you learn how to use them. And we have software like this available for both our clustering work and our trees, our decision trees work. Um, you can find that software linked from my website or from the, the archive manuscripts. And finally, I just want to conclude with maybe the most important part, which is a thank you to my amazing collaborators. Um, on the left, we have Anna Neufeld, who's my current PhD student at um, UW Statistics. She led the work on decision trees that I talked about at the end of this talk. In the middle, we have Lucy Gao, who was the first author of the paper on selective inference for clustering and also a key player in the decision trees work. Um, she recently completed a PhD with me at UW Biostat and now she's faculty at University of Waterloo. And finally on the right is my long-term collaborator, Jacob Pian, who's faculty at University of Southern California. Um, and he is um, a co-author on the first part of this work on clustering. So uh, thanks so much to all of you for your attention, and I'd be happy to, to take a few questions in the time that remains. And I, I guess I'm not quite sure what's the, um, the format for questions here. Um, I think Jai Young is, uh, uh, is muted, so I think he'll unmute himself. People can ask on the chat or can unmute themselves, I think. I'll just wait for him to unmute himself. Okay, so maybe I don't know where he is. Okay, maybe, uh, okay, he's back. It looks like there's a question from Andre, yeah. Andre Strucker. Okay, go ahead. Oh, can you hear, oh, oh. Hi, uh, I hope we hear each other. Yeah, I can hear you. Thanks, basically uh, my question, goes in the line of the usage of selective inference in those two cases. Could this also be solved by any different manner? Um, because basically, if I understand correctly, you solve for the growing size here of the, say, of the sample and similar. Could any other methods also be used? And is there also some cost in terms of using selective inference? Thanks. Yeah, that's a great question. So is there something else that we could use instead of selective inference? So the thing that comes to mind for me as an alternative to selective inference is always mm -hmm. sample splitting, um, where we just take our data and we split it into two parts. So, so as we saw in the specific case of clustering, sample splitting just doesn't really work. Like it seems like it should work, but it just doesn't um, for the reasons that I talked about. But for decision trees, sample splitting does work. Like sample splitting is a really valid way to do inference on a decision tree where you split your data into two sets, you fit a decision tree, and then you test for a difference in means between the terminal nodes using the, the other part of the data that you didn't use to fit the tree. But the problem is that sample splitting for decision trees, it gives you a very nice answer to the wrong question. And so what I mean by this, I'm gonna go back to sharing my slides. So like we can think about this application here to the box lunch study. So this is the exact dendrogram that they showed in their paper. All that I've done is I've reformatted it using you know, our software and I've reported p-values that weren't part of their paper. But all the splits, everything is identical to what's in their paper. Because in their paper, they reported results on all of their observations. They didn't just report results on half of their observations. So if I tried to use sample splitting to evaluate the results of the box lunch study, I actually wouldn't be able to because I'd have to take the data, split it in two, fit a tree on half of it, and then I could perform inference on the other half. You, I could perform inference using the other half, but it would be inference for the wrong tree because this is the tree that was shown in that paper. So the, the, really the issue with sample splitting is that even outside of settings where it just doesn't work like clustering, even if you can do it, it'll answer a question, but it's not usually the right question because usually the right question is a question about all of the data. Like if you tell a scientist, great, I have a really wonderful way for you to do inference, but please throw away half your data or you know, I'm, I'm only gonna allow you to report results on half the data. 
that isn't very satisfying. The investigator wants to show the dendrogram or the, the decision tree or whatever it is, whatever is the output of their analysis. They want to show it using all of the data, not using just half the data. So, so basically, to summarize my answer to your question, sometimes sample splitting is an alternative, but even when it works, I find it to be not very satisfying from an applied perspective in that it, it does not usually satisfy the data analysts' needs. Thank you. And I'm, I'm happy to take any additional questions. Any other question? Uh, if you any other question? Uh, if not, I have your question. Uh, can you can you test the uh, equality of the, all uh, cluster means? Oh, can I test the equality of all of the cluster means? Yes, I can. All right. So um, we could, yeah. So of course, in the case of just two clusters, I already am testing the equality of all the cluster means. But in the case of more than two clusters, I can think about an a test where I'm testing like whether mu bar c1 hat equals mu bar c2 hat equals mu bar c3 hat, and so on. And yeah, to do that, um, instead of just conditioning on whether the CK and CK prime clusters are in are obtained from clustering X prime of B, I would need to cluster. I would need to to condition on whether all of the clusters mm -hmm. are present, um, and it would just be like a slight extension to what we've already done, but it wouldn't be computationally any more demanding. Okay, I see. Thank you. Okay, is, is there any other question? Otherwise, let's thank our speaker. Thank you so much um, uh, to you, Jayoung, for chairing the session, um, to everyone for attending, and again, to the IMS for this really great honor. I see, thank you for your lecture, okay.